Hello and welcome to this session on information retrieval. Today our focus is on index compression. Before we get into index compression, it is useful to know some statistical properties of terms. Um, specifically, we will discuss the rule of 30, Heap's law and Zip's law. Uh, and then we move on to index compression. And as we already have seen, uh, our inverted index is made up of dictionary and postings. Um, we discuss uh, index compression in two parts uh, on how to compress the dictionaries and how to compress the postings. Let's start with the rule of 30. It says that the 30 most common words account for 30% of the tokens in written text. Um, and this gives us uh, clues of what we call as the stop words list. Right? The most common words uh, make up for the bulk of the content. So given a collection of documents, uh, how do we estimate the number of terms uh, in the document? Often this kind of an estimate is useful uh, to plan for, let's say, buying the uh, hardware uh, infrastructure um, or even to wonder how much of compression do we need. So take a moment to think, if I give you a large collection of documents, how could you even estimate how many terms uh, might exist there. Let me remind you here, terms are those uh, tokens that we are interested in uh, indexing or storing, right? So these are after the stop words removal. Please pause the video here and think. Okay. Here is one bad approach. Um, let's use some existing dictionary and uh, we say that uh, all the terms in the dictionary are, are uh, indexable terms. Um, so the Oxford Dictionary uh, defines about 600,000 uh, words. So that's one estimate of how much uh, words we could have. Uh, but this is not a good estimate because uh, Often in the real world, the documents contain uh, entities like people, places, products, which uh, exist in the query and the documents. So obviously they become terms, but uh, they may not exist in the uh, English dictionary. So what do we do? So in this context, uh, uh, we have an empirical finding known as Heap's law, uh, which says M is directly proportional to t raised to the power b, where m is the size of the vocabulary, t is the number of tokens in the collection. So if I know how many tokens do I have in the collection, then uh, I can approximate uh, uh, the size of the vocabulary uh, m to uh, k times uh, t raised to the power of b where k and b are some empirical constants. When we applied this uh, on the RCV1 uh, data set, so this is a popular data set uh, from Reuters. Um, uh, um, I believe they are on the news articles. Um, we, we were able to fit a um, uh, heap slot to it uh, as follows. So with k uh, equivalent to 10 raised to the power 1.64, which is approximately 44, and B uh, as 0.49. For the first uh, 1 million on our, or, and odd or tokens, uh, this law predicts uh, 38,323 terms. Um, and actually, in reality, we had about 38,365 terms, which is fairly close. But remember, these are all empirical in nature. Um, so if the collections are sufficiently large enough, then they are very likely uh, to adhere to these laws. So the takeaways for us from Heap's law um, is twofold. One, dictionary size grows with the collection size, which looks obvious. And size of the dictionary can get really, really large. Um, so just the dictionary size alone 
can can still be large and this calls for the need to consider uh, compression techniques uh, to be applied on dictionaries okay um, here is a short paragraph given to you uh, the question is what are the top three uh, frequent terms in the text given below um, and give me also the frequency of those terms so if you are watching this video offline please pause the video here and uh, and figure out which are the top three frequent terms and also compute their frequency let me move on so here are the most frequent terms and um, it turns out that the repeating uh, tokens uh, the highly repeating tokens are u b in and your um, so this is after case folding um, so u appears five times b appears three times um, and there are in and your uh, terms appearing uh, two times okay um, so in this uh, so so we do see uh, uh, that uh, the the frequency has something to do with the rank and this is what is hinted by the zips law so zips law states that the ith most frequent term has a frequency proportional to 1 over i or in other words the frequency and the rank are inversely inversely proportional to each other okay um, so look at uh, this example uh, where we worked out the frequencies uh, so in this uh, short document uh, um, of course uh, these laws apply on large collection of document you should keep that in mind and this is just for illustration so if i have a collection like this and if i count the number of times a, a word appears and uh, order them by frequency so i have u at the first rank with uh, six occurrences uh, the with at the second position with three occurrences and so on and we can see that uh, um, uh, the rank uh, is indeed uh, inversely proportional to frequency as the rank grows the frequency drops again on the reuters rcv1 data set uh, we do see that the zips law applies um, uh, pretty nicely So with that introduction, let's uh, start discussing um, how to how do we actually compress uh, the dictionaries and how do we compress the postings as well uh, after this part. Okay, so here is a dictionary. So let's assume I have several terms. Uh, I have several terms here, and I also have the document frequency uh, with me. And then the postings list follows, uh, which for us is not the focus. Uh, for this section at least um, so one way to store the dictionary is to store it as a sorted array um, where each term has a fixed length of let's say 20 bytes um, so i have just arbitrarily arbitrarily assigned 20 bytes over here um, in reality this could be uh, slightly larger than the largest expected uh, term okay um, and then we have the document frequency uh, so let's assume these are integers uh, occupying about four bytes and we also need uh, a pointer to point to the first element of the uh, sorted postings list uh, so that's another four point four bytes let's see so for each term so we have 20 plus 4 plus 4 bytes uh, um, uh, we could store the dictionary like this but then uh, uh, this uh, occupies too much of unnecessary space uh, so let's say in this case uh, a doesn't need 20 bytes uh, but we still uh, use 20 bytes to store such a uh, short uh, uh, term uh, well uh, can we do better how how can we store the dictionary in such a way that uh, we save some space One approach here uh, is to store dictionary as a string. So if I store the entire dictionary as a long uh, string, um, then um, I can save a lot of space. So all I need to uh, know is uh, where does each term start and where does uh, that term end. Um, so this information 
can be stored uh, separately uh, in a table. Uh, so for example, uh, so let's say I have uh, three bytes uh, to store a term pointer and I say that uh, this particular term starts here and the next term starts here and so on. So if I if I just have term pointers uh, to say to tell me um, where that term starts in the string, then I don't need uh, 20 bytes anymore and that saves uh, a lot of uh, space for me. Can we do even better? Once again, pause and see if you can come up with a way um, to save even more space. It turns out that there is an even better way of doing this uh, if we consider block uh, storage option. So in the block storage option, all we do is uh, for a block of let's say four items, uh, in this case the block size uh, is four, um, uh, we try to avoid k minus one pointers. So in other words, uh, what we do is from, so, so there is again a term pointer for one word, so this, this term is pointed to here and the number that it points to tells me how many characters I should read uh, to consider that as a term. So the first term is seven characters long. So I read till this style and from there the next word starts. So if I'm interested in the third word, I simply go to the, I follow the pointer um, and then skip seven characters and then read the next character, which is nine and then skip nine and then read eight and then read those eight characters here. So CZ GL or whatever. So this is the uh, third term um, that uh, I should read. So this is one idea to store. Uh, so in this way, uh, what I have done is uh, I have avoided uh, uh, k minus one term pointers and that's a lot of uh, space saved. Can we do even better? This is the beauty of this subject. Um, so it turns out that there is an even better way of um, uh, storing dictionaries. Uh, the clue here is that um, we know that the consecutive entries uh, in the dictionary are alphabetically sorted, so they are likely to share common prefixes. With this clue, can you think about a better way to store the dictionary? Once again, pause here and think. Right. Just look at uh, these terms. All of them start with S Y, S Y, S Y, S Y. So now that I know these are alphabetically sorted and they are likely to have common prefixes, how can I do this better? So we use a technique called friend coding, where um, where this is what we try to do. So let's say we have one block. Uh, in a block compression, let's say k equals 4 in this case. So I have four uh, terms. Uh, um, so let's say the terms are automata, automate, automatic, and automation. Um, and uh, the first letter, first digit tells you how long the term is. So there are eight characters in automata, eight characters in automate, nine in automatic, and ten in automation. So now, how can I compress this string? So that's the question. And here is one idea. So let's take the common prefix out of all these four out and the common prefix turns out to be automat, right? So I keep the prefix out as automat and then I use some delimiter. So in this case, the delimiter is um, an asterisk. And then I say that the first letter, first term um, has eight characters. So if the first term has eight characters, I should use automat, which is seven characters and one more character, which is eight. So automata becomes the first word. All right, so after the eight characters, the next one um, tells you the, uh, the next term. And uh, I'm, I'm saying here that I should just read uh, one more character, which is E and append it to the prefix. So automate is the next one. And uh, then I say the next term uses two, uh, two characters more than the prefix. So that is automatic and then automation. 
Uh, notice that I use a different delimiter um, to differentiate between the terms uh, in my block storage and uh, uh, the prefix. Uh, so the first one separates prefix from the terms and the rest of them um, just uh, uh, separate the terms. So once again, so I know automat is the, uh, is the prefix and uh, I know that A joins with automat to become automata, E joins with automat to become automate and then automatic and automation. So this gives the same information as the one before, but uh, this string is much, much smaller than the original string. So we have um, again saved uh, some valuable space. All right, so here is uh, another opportunity for you to pause the video and work out uh, um, the front code uh, for interspecies, interstellar and interstate. Uh, so this is a block storage example with k equals, k equals three. Let's look at the answer. Okay, so we have, um, okay, so let me tease you with two answer choices. What do you think is correct? In the first option, um, so I have inter as the prefix and species stellar and state. Um, so of course, uh, the first word has 12 letters. Uh, inter is five and then I have uh, uh, seven uh, letters here so that's 12 for interspecies seven for inter uh, seven more for uh, to add stellar with inter so that's interstellar and then five more um, to add uh, with state so that's interstate um, so these are the words so that's one one way to do the friend coding or another way is um, interspecies stellar and t what did you arrive at so this is the usual common mistake that happens when I give this as a um, teaser question. Uh, usually students come up with uh, the first option, whereas the second one is the right one where um, we do um, compress more and gain some more space. So we are interested not in finding meaningful prefixes, but in finding the longest prefix, which is common to all the terms so that uh, the overall length of the string is reduced. For, for those who don't know, uh, this uh, is a famous comedian uh, in the Tamil movie industry. His name is Vadivelu. I like his expressions and uh, and sometimes uh, um, I use them in my lectures. Okay, let's move on. So here is this uh, dictionary as a string idea. Uh, we stored... Uh, the entire list of dictionary terms as one long string and we had uh, pointers uh, to each uh, one. So that was uh, one uh, way to, uh, one way we started off uh, to compress uh, the dictionary uh, storage. And um, okay, so here is a worked out uh, example of you know, how it uh, reduces uh, the total size. Okay, um, if we were to store frequencies, um, so now here is the other part uh, which we have been discussed so far. So another part of the dictionary is of course the term frequencies, so which are a bunch of numbers and these numbers could be really large. Okay, all right. So given that I have many large numbers and I have to store them, um, is there a way I can save some space uh, here? on storing large numbers. So the question is how to store a large number of numbers efficiently. One idea here is instead of storing the numbers, we could store the gaps. So for, for instance, let's say I want to store 33, 47, 154, 159 and 202, some five numbers. What can I do? So I store the first number as it is 33. And then instead of storing 47, I store the gap between 33 and 47. The logic is that if these are sorted in order, in increasing order, then the gap is likely to be a smaller number than the number itself. And storing smaller number should take lesser space. So storing gaps should be more profitable to us compared to storing the actual numbers itself. 
So we have 14 here and the gap between 47 and 154 is computed which is 107 so I just stored 107 the gap between 154 and 159 is 5 so I store the gap 5 and so on. So this is one way uh, I could uh, uh, I could achieve some compression. Now can we do even better and the clue this time is the smaller numbers can be represented using fewer bits. We don't need, uh, you know, so let's say an integer takes four bytes. Um, I don't need the full four bytes to store smaller numbers. Uh, so what could we do? So here is one idea uh, which we call as variable byte encoding. So let's say we want to store 824, 829, 215406 and some large numbers like that. So first we could figure out the gaps. Uh, so we keep the first number as it is. So let's take down 824 as it is. And the gap between 824 and 829 turns out to be 5. And this gap turns out to be a little larger, 214577 and so on. Right. So the idea now is somehow to use a variable number of bytes to store these numbers. So for smaller numbers I want to use lesser number of bytes and for larger numbers I want to store a larger number of bytes. So each to store each number I no more use the fixed four bytes but I use uh, uh, variable bytes. So in this case I store 824 as 6 and 56 using um, uh, as two different small numbers and I take down 5 as it is and I represent 214577 as 3 numbers 13, 12 and 49. But what are uh, these numbers and how have they come? Let me give you a minute to read the slide and uh, understand this for yourself. Hopefully you have got the idea. If not, please pause the video here and try to understand what's going on here. Let me explain now um, what the idea is. So let's say we use seven bits uh, to represent um, each number. Then we have um, 824 as 2 raised to the power 7 times 6 plus 56. So I just factorize 824 as um, 56 uh, plus 2 raised to the power 7 times uh, 6. So I simply store uh, 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 56 and 6 um, to represent this number. So uh, why am I interested in 7 digits? Um, the idea is that I use 7 bits to represent the number. So for example 6 is simply 110 and let's say we append uh, four more zeros to it. So a seven bit uh, representation of six would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay, so there is one more bit, I'll come to that in a second. And similarly, I can have 56 as 0, 000, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so I need one more bit to say when 84 has ended, assuming this entire long byte stream represents all these numbers then I should say that 84 is over and from here 829 is starting. So the way to tell that is to use a bit called the continuation bit and when so we use a continuation bit of 1 to the last byte uh, you know so which uh, marks the end of that uh, number. So 824 um, is 6 and 56 and 56 is the last number in that representation so we put a continuation bit of one here and all the other ones before would have a zero uh, as uh, as the continuation bit value so we have uh, four zeros zero one one zero one zero 
triple one triple zero to represent uh, 824. Now I want to store the gap 5. Uh, 5 is simply 0 and uh, 5 so I can I can just use 5 so I don't need uh, another byte here one one byte is enough to store 5 and in that one byte so 101 is of course 5 and this is the last byte so the continuation bit is 1 right so I use 7 bits for the number 1 continuation bit to say that the byte is over so now I can move to the next number 214577 now what is 214577 again I um, I try to split it into bytes and it turns out that for this number I need three bytes if I were to use seven seven bits um, uh, to represent uh, each factor so in this case I can simply represent this number as uh, 49 plus 12 plus 2 raised to the power 7 times 13 and the whole uh, times 2 power 7 so that is so, so this is the way I could factorize 214577 and I simply take uh, these numbers which is 49, 12 and 13 and represent them um, uh, in my byte stream. Okay, so now how do, so once you have a long byte stream like this, how do you decode the byte stream? You keep reading the byte stream till you see the first continuation bit as 1 and when it is 1 you stop there and this entire so let me use my pen so I, I keep reading this and whenever I see a 1 I stop there and this these two things together represent 1 uh, one number so so it is simply you take this number plus 2, power, two raised to the power 7 times um, the other number uh, so it's 5 so this 5 plus 2 raised to the power 7 times this number. So we got um, we got the first number 824. And then I again see here the continuation bit is 1 right away. So I stop here. So that's how um, I segment this uh, byte stream. And from there I can get this long sequence of gaps. So this is a clever technique uh, to avoid uh, wasting space uh, in storing large numbers. Okay, so let's take another dig at uh, 214577. Uh, so it's the same example used in this slide. Um, how did I arrive at um, uh, 49, 12, and uh, 13? Well, um, simply, so if 214577 is the number to start with, uh, uh, since we are dealing with 7 bit uh, representations, I divide the n by 128 and take the floor of it so i get a 1676 uh, as the factor and the remainder as 49 and then i take 1676 and i continue the process of dividing it over 128 so this is simple binary conversion um, we get uh, uh, this goes 13 times and the remainder is 12 and uh, finally uh, 13 goes 0 times and the remainder is uh, 13. So once I have uh, these remainders, I just uh, write it in this fashion, 13, 12, and 49. So which means uh, uh, this whole number is simply 13 times 128 uh, plus 12 uh, times 128 plus uh, 49. So thus we have 214577 represented as three numbers, 49, 12, and 13, uh, uh, as three different uh, 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 seven bit uh, binary strings uh, where we add one more bit as the continuation bit and the continuation bit is one for the last byte so that is for this one so that allows us to uh, encode and decode uh, these numbers so you see that for larger numbers we end up taking more bytes and for smaller numbers we use uh, lesser bytes to store so that's the whole idea So here is an exercise for you. Please uh, try it yourself. What would be the variable byte code for the postings list if the postings list had 100, 200, um, uh, 400, and 800? And let's say I want to uh, store these numbers using our variable byte encoded format. So the answer 
goes something like this. So I have 100, 200, 400, and 800, which I want to store. The gaps are 100, 100, 200, and 400. And now we decompose the gaps. Uh, we come up with, uh, um, uh, with seven bit representation. So we keep dividing by 128 and keep seeing the reminders. Um, and for 100, uh, it's, we can just use one byte uh, and the remainder is 100. Uh, for 200, I need two bytes, uh, 72 and one. For 400, again, I need two bytes with 16 and three. So these are the representations. So 100 and 100 goes in just one byte each. And then we have two two bytes to represent uh, 400 and 800 respectively. And since 100 is in a single byte, the first bit is uh, is one, the continuation bit is one. Um, and in the other two cases, the second continuation bit is one, that's something to note. Otherwise, we have uh, the seven digit representation of our numbers, seven bit binary representation of our numbers. So the final, uh, the variable byte encoded value for this would look uh, something like this. All right, uh, with that then, uh, let's stop here. I hope uh, you understood uh, the key concepts. So today we started with uh, with some, um, some laws, there are some empirical findings on uh, uh, term frequencies, um, the heaps law, the zips law, and the rule of 30. And then we moved on uh, to discuss how we could compress uh, the dictionary. And dictionary has two parts, uh, the postings and the, uh, and uh, the dictionary and the postings basically, and dictionary has two parts, the frequency and the terms. Um, and we took the uh, terms and we initially um, took the simple case of storing them in a fixed length array. Then we saw that uh, storing dictionary as a string uh, saves more space. And then we said uh, we can even reduce the number of pointers by having a block uh, to have a single pointer and uh, just encoding the length of each term uh, along with the string. So that was the blocked uh, dictionary storage idea. And from there, uh, we went on uh, to do, um, uh, we, we asked, can we do even better? We did friend coding uh, where we extracted the prefix out and then used that to save even more space. Then we focused on the numbers as in the frequencies uh, so how do we store large numbers effectively? So it turns out that storing gaps is a good idea. And from there, we moved on uh, uh, to a variable byte encoding where even to store these gaps, which are most likely to be smaller numbers, um, we don't want to use uh, four bytes uh, to store each of these numbers. So the question was, can I decompose these numbers into smaller numbers and uh, have uh, um, variable number of bytes to represent them. And that was the idea behind variable bit encoding, variable byte encoding, rather. Um, and that saves uh, a lot of space. With that then, thank you for listening and I look forward to see you again for the next lecture. Bye.